I'd like to welcome you to our first, hopefully, of what will be an annual Women's History Month social tea, or tea social. Um, we have several guest speakers today. We have Diana Zinel from our Franklin County Chamber of Commerce. We have Casey Warren, our town administrator, Jennifer Gannett, our assistant town administrator, Pat Ryan, a local author, um, and you will also be hearing from myself today. So I wanted to put this together for several reasons. One, uh, women are not appreciated as much as we should be for all of the hard work and effort that we do within our communities and amongst our families. And I'm really happy to see you gentlemen here today to listen and support. Um, this is really important because I think a lot of times when events like this are held, sometimes men don't feel like they're welcome and they are most certainly welcome. Um, this is just a way for, to end March, which March was the entire month of Women's History Month. Um, as you know, may notice on our flyer, I also put Women's History because, you know, everything for uh, grammatical reasons sometimes is put with men. So let's make it about women for, for a little while. Um, so we will hear from our speakers who will talk a little bit about their journey and inspirational women who have been in their lives who maybe have inspired them to take the path that they have been on to enter into these positions that they currently are in um, and along their journey. We also have a raffle, um, and I'll go over to some other things before we have the speakers come up, but 80-somethings, a practical guide to letting go, aging well, and finding unexpected happiness by Catherine Esty, PhD. She is coming to speak um, through Valley Neighbors at the Waitley, or the old Waitley Town Hall, um, and that will be next Tuesday, or Tuesday, April 5th, from 11 to noon. We'll also be sharing that in our newsletter this month. So you have a chance to win a free copy of her book. We will have a table where you can write your name and put it in a container so we can raffle it off at the end of the event today. Anybody? I'd like to welcome up first Diana Zinel. She is from our Franklin County Chamber of Commerce. Diana. Hello everybody, what a nice treat to be asked to, to speak a little bit about my journey, because I'm not sure I've ever been asked that before. So this is interesting. Um, so I am, I am the Executive Director of the Franklin County Chamber of Commerce. I just announced last week that I'll be leaving that job to become president of the Springfield Regional Chamber of Commerce, which I'm really excited about, proud of. I'll be sad to, to leave the Franklin County Chamber because it's such a wonderful organization, um, but it certainly is a good opportunity for me. I'm also chair of the Hatfield Select Board. Um, so how I got here is kind of an interesting story. And really and truly, I would point to two failures in my life that really directed me to where I am. And I think it's important to know that sometimes failures can actually take you where you ultimately need to be. So when I was in college, um, I was going to UMass. I was probably about 20. And I actually was living a couple of doors down on Sugarloaf Street. Does anybody remember Marjorie and Bob Decker? Yeah, so I used to rent one of their apartments and so I was going to school and I was working a couple of jobs because I was struggling to make my portion of the rent, which was $132 every month. And um, working along and really just wearing myself out. And I had someone from the town of Hatfield that I knew who was on the select board at the time, who was a friend of my mom's, call me and say, hey, we have this part-time job in Hatfield at the town hall, would you be interested in taking it? And I. I took it because I, I decided to take time off from school. So that was kind of my first failure was I left college and I never went back. So a lot of people are surprised to learn I do not have a bachelor's degree. Um, I was probably two and a half years in um, to a teaching degree when, when I left school and went to work for Hatfield for what I thought was gonna be a few months to save up some money so that I could go back to school, and I really never went back. The reason I never went back was because I fell in love with working in town government. 
And so they, they ended up asking me to, to, to get up to stay on full time and I became clerk to the board of selectmen in Hatfield. And so I used to sit at the select board table and I, I had this great board that I loved, but I used to sit there and think, hmm, I would have done things differently. And one of these days, I'm gonna sit on that side of the table and, and do things a little bit differently than, than they've been doing it. So, you know, from there, I, did, I, I, I worked for the town for a number of years. I then went up to Greenfield and I worked for a municipal attorney um, for many years. So still working on, uh, you know, town issues, um, but from a little bit different perspective. And then ultimately found my way to working for Hampshire County back when there used to be counties, and was doing that when it converted over to the Hampshire Council of Governments. And it was in that work um, that I met uh, a gentleman who at the time was Chief of Staff for State Rep Bill Nagel. His name was Peter Cocott, um, so I worked with him quite a bit. And when, when Bill Nagel uh, decided not to be a rep anymore, Peter Cocott decided to run for his spot. And he asked me to be his campaign manager in Hatfield. And it was through that work with Peter that he asked me to come on board and be his staff person if he, if he won, which he did. Some of you may know Peter Cocott or know of the work he did because he was really a, a fantastic man and a, and a great legislator. And I ended up working for him um, until he died. Uh, very unexpectedly, which was very difficult for me. Um, but I was his district director, so I worked for the legislature for 17 years under him. I don't know, 17 years went by like that. Um, but it, I gained a lot of experience in that job and uh, decided to run for his job, decided to run for his position after he passed away with a lot of encouragement from a lot of people. Um, and did this campaign right after losing someone that I would say I loved like a brother um, while I was still working full time. <laughs> it was 2018 is a blur to me. And I ended up losing in the primary. And that's the second failure that I was referring to. Um, it, it never, I knew I would land on my feet, but it ended up leading me to the job at the chamber which was really, I feel like, where I was really supposed to be, where I could work on economic development and workforce development and business support, the things that had really um, lit a fire under me when I was working for Peter Cocott. So I guess the point of my story is sometimes you just have to roll with the punches and life will take you where you're supposed to go. Um, and, and now I, I have this job that I've just, you know, immersed myself in um, and, and, and it paid off because Springfield came a calling and now I'm gonna be you know, going to this even bigger arena. So um, it, it's really been an interesting journey. And I, you mentioned women that inspired me and I, I guess I would have to say, of course, my mom. Um, my mother dropped out of school in eighth grade and uh, you know, had no education beyond that, never returned to school. She raised five kids, mostly on her own, and just worked really hard and taught all of us to work really hard. And she was, um, how do I say this without swearing? She was just kind of, she was just a very no bullshit person, right? She was just straight up and um, so she was, she was very inspiring to me. Um, she never let having no education hold her back from things. I mean, she never worked in jobs um, that really required much education, but she worked hard and she managed to support all of us. And I guess the other woman that I would, I draw a lot of inspiration from is my daughter, um, who's 17 and same thing, works really hard. And uh, doesn't, you know, a lot of kids at that age get caught up in drama and gossip and all of those types of things, and she just rises above all of it. And she works hard, she's the president of her class, um, and I just love watching her. You know, she keeps me going, watching that. So that's my journey. I don't know, are we, are, are people asking questions, or do you, how do you? If they would like to ask questions, they can. Oh, and I'm still and I'm still on the Hatfield Select Board. So I did two terms 
back when I had very young kids, I don't know how I did that. I truly don't know how I did I actually had my third baby while I was on the select board. That was crazy. But now my kids are a little bit older and I'm back on and uh, just finishing up my third term and I'm, you know, running for a, a third term. Unopposed because nobody really wants that job. But, um, so I, but it, it's something that for whatever reason feeds my soul. It's hard. It can be really hard. You know, we, we had a five hour meeting last week after a long day of work and everything else, but I do really love it. Um, so anyway, I don't know if anybody has any questions. And then I want to put my little plug in if I could. You can put your plug in. Okay, so, the, so one of the things the Franklin County Chamber of Commerce does is we're also the tourism agency for Franklin County. Um, believe it or not, a lot of tourists come to Franklin County for the obvious things like Yankee Candle and Berkshire East and Crump and Fox. Um, but you know, a lot of people come here for outdoor recreation. So we have just moved our offices to Historic Deerfield. People may have read in the paper. And we're opening a new visitor center. Because it used to be in that little depressing corner of the Registry of Motor Vehicles. You've all seen it. <laughs> we weren't really proud of that. So we're gonna make this really cute space in Historic Deerfield. And we're looking for pe volunteers who might wanna um, be in the visitor center to greet people and sort of direct them around the room and maybe give them suggestions about things there are to do in Franklin County. So if you really enjoy meeting people and interacting with people um, and you love this, this place we all call home and you wanna um, you know, sign up for some volunteer time, I have some information about it and I have a little sign up sheet um, so that you can come in and, and meet us and see the space and, and think about it. So um, I'll, I'll have that on the table over there if anybody's interested. But I don't, does anybody have any questions? No. No. Okay. Thank you so much. And one of the reasons I asked Diana is we met years ago when our sons played football together. And I have seen her busy with her children running from here, there, and everywhere. And she, you know, she loves what she does. So if you would like to volunteer at the Franklin County Chamber, it's a wonderful opportunity. So next I'd like to ask our town administrator from Deerfield, Casey Warren, to come up here and talk to you. <laughs> Casey does so much every day and I'm so grateful that she was able to take the time because we talk about inspiration in our lives and it's been wonderful to work with you and you inspire me every day to keep going with all of the things I see you accomplish. So thank and yet you. I sit in the back behind my, op behind my desk going, how do I fit that in? So I'm Casey. I'm now the Deerfield Town Administrator, but prior to my municipal career, I attended business school at UMass like Diana did. And my focus was in hospitality, which is really service. You should volunteer. <laughs> in my copious spare time. <laughs> oh good, I'm glad I'm not the only one that, I was quiet. I am usually the heckler in the back, so thank you. <laughs> it makes me feel much more comfortable. So I started in municipal government in 1996 in the Sunderland Police Department, which one of our, our people around here, Sharon Pachurik, um, remembers. That's how I met Sharon. That's how I met Chief Pajurik. So I moved from the police department into the select board and then I moved to Deerfield. I worked in Deerfield for 17 years and worked as the administrative assistant, the executive assistant, and then as interim and finally permanent town administrator. I brought, left briefly to work in Asheville because I wanted a different municipal experience. I wanted to know what it was like in a smaller town. But to me, we're talking about the people that inspired us and got us to our place. It's not just famous women. It's like Diana. It's the people in our personal history that are the most powerful. So three women had a profound effect on my career. One was our former town accountant, Janet Swem. Some of you may have known Janet. Um, she was an amazing person, and she was an amazing person. The next person is Wendy Foxman. She's also a past town administrator for Deerfield. And she, Janet helped me understand the value of opportunity. 
Wendy taught me the value of the word enough. And then there's this amazing person out there. Her name is Dr. Brene Brown. She is a professor and a researcher at the University of Houston. And she writes, she has written, I think, six books at this point. I haven't read the last one. Um, she, she teaches that there is no courage without vulnerability and no accomplishment without fear. Like I said, Dr. Br Dr. Brown has written many books, but the one that really sort of got to me was Daring Greatly. It starts with an excerpt from a portion of a famous speech given by Theodore Roosevelt. Now I know we're talking about women, but this quote is the reason the book was written. It flows through the entire learning experience in this book. So I'm gonna read it to you and then I'm gonna finish myself up. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again. Because there's no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms, great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause? Who at the best knows in the end the triumph of achievement? And who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly? For me, that's all about vulnerability. And in my job, I've scrutinized quite a bit. What I say makes it into the paper, and I always tell Chris Laramie, don't quote me. And he laughs and he says, don't talk. <laughs> but vulnerability is not knowing victory or defeat. It's understanding the necessity for both. It's being all in. In my job, I'm all in. I would not still be here if I wasn't. Municipal government is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> but putting oneself out there, showing up, like today, it takes courage especially since our culture values perfection, particularly for women in the workplace. No matter what you hear, there is that expectation and has been since the day I started working and probably, hopefully, my nieces will not have to face as much of that as they grow into their professional lives. But perfection is not the same as striving for excellence. Perfection is not about healthy achievement. Perfection is a defensive move. It's the belief that we can do things perfectly and look perfect. We, if we do that, we can minimize or avoid the pain of, of blame, judgment, and shame. When you know you're not perfect, but perfect is the goal, you either hustle for the perfection or you lean into the vulnerability and you own the fear by taking the risk. Sometimes that means when you fall short, the result is shame. Shame is the most powerful emotion. It's the fear that we're not enough. Not being perfect, always feeling what you do is not enough, is not alien to most of us. We often, women in particular, devalue ourselves because we have to juggle so much. We don't think we can get there. You know, it's looking perfect, having the perfect rewarding job, being the perfect mother that shows up at every event, having dinner on the table every night, and doing it all without any seeming effort. But perfect is the enemy of good. My old boss in Asheville would be so proud of me for actually getting the quote right this time, <laughs> because I used to stumble over it all the time. I believe that for others. I always try to share that when people are struggling in the workplace, like sometimes Jennifer will look at me and just go, and I say, it's good enough. Um, or don't, don't worry about that, we'll get there when we get there. I expect people to show up to do the best they can with the resources they have, and at the end of the day, that's enough for them. That's enough, I don't expect them to be perfect. But it's hard for me, because I do expect myself to be perfect. So my goal of striving may be this high, 
but the tools at my disposal may only be this high. <laughs> so I keep trying to remind myself, and that's what this book was so powerful about. And that's what learning from Wendy and Janet was so powerful for me to get to my, where I am now. Because it's not about being perfect. Sometimes I even remember to say that I'm an aspiring good at nothing, as opposed to a recovering perfectionist. So the thing that, come, that brings me to this whole point is this message that vulnerability isn't weak, weakness, but it helps us engage, is powerful. It takes courage, courage to show up, to finish a report, to make that phone call or respond to that email, or get the select board packet done before 15 minutes before a meeting, because sometimes that happens. Especially going on vacation. For me, that's hard, because the tasks on the desk seem to be this high. But if we go back to what Theodore Roosevelt said at his speech at the Sorbonne called the citizen, Citizenship in a Republic, I am the woman in the arena. Jennifer's the woman in the arena. Diana's the woman in the arena. You all have your own arena. I'm struggling. I'm wiping off the blood and dusting myself off and yelling and crying and laughing, but always challenging myself to look for the opportunity and to get, up, get back out there and dare greatly, because that's enough. If you get a chance and you want to watch something really fun, um, Dr. Brown actually has a special on Netflix. It's called, called The Call to Courage. And, oh, and you know, if you, some of us need to look, talk to our grandchildren, nieces and nephews to find a Netflix account, but they have it, I guarantee it. So if you wanted to watch something fun, that's something amazingly fun. It's like a combination of stand-up and a lecture. It's an, it's an hour, I think, but it's really worth the watch. Thank you. Thank you, Casey, so much for the great speech. Next, I'd like to invite up Jennifer Gannett, who is our assistant town administrator. She has an amazing story to share with you today about family. Jennifer. I love having to follow Casey. <laughs> you go first. Um, so, my name is Jennifer Gannett. I'm the assistant town administrator, as Jennifer has said. I've been now working in Deerfield for two years. I started municipal work uh, seven years ago, eight years ago. I worked in Amherst for five years. I landed in municipal work just by chance. I, um, uh, I'll start, I'll go back a little bit. So I was um, in college and I was young and I decided that I was gonna drop out of Mount Holyoke because I knew better than my parents and I was gonna get married. So I did that, I dropped out of Mount Holyoke and I was a double major at psych there. Decided to get married, had two beautiful children and then I decided that I would go back to school to get my degree in communications and I graduated at UMass from there. Then I decided that I didn't want to be married anymore. <laughs> so I had to, I was a school bus driver, two little babies and I had to find a job. So I started as a property manager and then I became, um, I did small units in West Springfield, larger 247 units in Amherst, and then there was a job opening at the town of Amherst as um, doing their rental permits. And in 11 months I was promoted to permit administrator and that dealt with all permitting aspects for the town. So you're putting a fence in or you're making a large science center and I guided applicants, constituents through the entire process. So I was there for five years and there was, I call it sort of the pickaxe, you know, there was no place for me to go. The town says, you're really smart and you have ambition, but we're not gonna pay you anymore and I just kept on taking on tasks. So I decided that I was gonna go into the private sector for a year and then I realized, no, 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 I like working for a municipality and I found this job in Deerfield and I'm so happy to be here and, um, and help the town through the processes. We're a small community and so like Casey was saying about resources, we don't have quite the resources that Amherst has and so trying to um, you know, get the tools together so that um, we can get up to a different standard would be wonderful. So that's 
That's and my answer. Yeah, we I'm pushing. A lot of <laughs> so, um, a little bit about my past past. Um, I have women that have been strong women in my life for a very long time. And so my great-grandmother was an illustrator, Ruth Gannett. And so she illustrated this book, which is really important um, right now in the time, because the first part of this book, and you'll know as soon as I start reading, it says, once upon a time, long ago, when the harvest season had come again in the Ukraine, the villagers were all busy cutting and gathering the wheat. For this is the land from which most Russians get the flour for their bread. So she was a very, very um, talented artist that did pointillism. So this is one of the books. What's the name of the book? My mother is the most beautiful woman in the world. And it, I have. My father owns the original pointillism, and I have a copy of it, and I will eventually get um, that original. And her daughter, so my grandfather's sister, was the author of another book, and it's called My Father's Dragon, which has run awards. And, in, and so collaboratively, they wrote and illustrated this book together and happened to be that both their names are Ruth. So it's Ruth Styles Gannett and illustrated by Ruth Christian Gannett. And I, when I got divorced, I took my name back because what the heck. And, <laughs> and it's just a very good, it's a series of books about Elmer and his travels to a different land and with this dragon friend. And it's, it's wonderful and it's won awards. And actually um, in Japan, they bought the rights to the series, and there's movies, and I have a little doll over there that was made, that a stuffed animal doll. And I think they've always impressed upon me um, women's, you know, that we can do anything that we put our minds to. And I was a, I was a single mom, and so I just kept striving to do better and better and better for my kids. I didn't think that I would be able to buy my own home or you know, be where I am today. And it just takes a lot of perseverance and here I am. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm gonna save Pat for last. Save the best for last. For one of the things that my opinion with Pat. Um, so my name is Jennifer Remillard and I'm gonna be your next presenter. And the reason this event was so important to me is because growing up as a little girl, I constantly heard, girls shouldn't do that, you should do this. And I would always challenge the status quo in my family. My grandmother used to get very frustrated with me. You talk before you, before you think. And I would say, no, this is how I feel. I feel as though I should be able to do what cousin so-and-so who's a boy is doing. And I pushed boundaries, and I continue to push boundaries. I think it's important to challenge things that you don't think are fair in life, but do it respectfully. And one of the other pieces I've seen over the years has been not just what women are allowed to do or what we what they say we should or shouldn't do with boundaries and limitations with gender roles. It's also about how we look. How many times have you grown up or at various points of life, I shouldn't leave the house, I don't look perfect today. I don't have my makeup on, my hair isn't done, my clothes are wrinkled. How many times have you thought that? I think that every day before I go out of the house. Today, I didn't want to be perfect. I am a recovering perfectionist. I am a recovering perfectionist because there are times, and Diana will tell you probably from years ago, doing various things, I wanted everything to be perfect because I had a vision in mind. And you know what? If it's not perfect, no one else knows that. Only you know that. And inside is, you can be your worst critic. That is something I've always heard. And I wanted to read a poem from Maya Angelou. I read this in high school and it's resonated with me my entire life. 
because I do not want to live up to society norm or societal norms. I want to live up to my expectations. I want to be happy. I want to love the body I live in every day. That's not always easy. You see, magazine articles with airbrushed models, with social media now for our younger women and younger girls, they live up to expectations that aren't real. Before the pandemic came, I did something brave. I did something that most women in my family do not even want to consider. I cut my, all my hair off to a pixie and I went natural. I no longer color my hair. Do you know why? Because I wanted to be me authentically. And this poem by Maya Angelou, Phenomenal Woman, was something that I've really taken to heart. And if you've never heard it before, I'm going to read it to you today. Pretty women wonder where my secrets lie. I'm not cute or built to suit a fashion model size. But when I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. I say, it's in the reach of my arms, the span of my hips, the stride <clears throat> of my step, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. I walk into a room just as cool as you please. And to a man, the fellows stand or fall on their knees. Then they swarm around me, a hive of honeybees. I say, it's the fire in my eyes and the flash of my teeth, the swing in my waist and the joy in my feet. I'm a woman phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. Men themselves have wondered what they see in me. They try so much, but they cannot touch my inner mystery. When I try to show them, they say they still can't see. I say, it's in the arch of my back, the sun of my smile, the ride of my breasts, the grace of my style. I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. Now you understand just why my head's not bowed. I don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. When you see me passing, it ought to make you proud. I say, it's in the click of my heels, the bend of my hair, the palm of my hand, the need for my care. Because I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. And I think of that every time I have a rough day where I worry about what people think of me. And let's face it, one of the things in society has been for centuries, thousands of years, is how are you perceived by your peers? How are you perceived in society? Is there gossip? Everyone, every day, is fighting a battle you don't see. You have things going on at home. You have things going on at work. You have things going on inside yourself. And we're not apt to share all of those secrets that exist. So when we get to the point in life where you're struggling, there are so many books in the world that you could read. My grandmother always said she never got to travel as much as she wanted to because she had 10 children. Well, if I had 10 children, I wouldn't travel either. <laughs> um, because trying to get 10 children together over the age span of 20 years from the oldest to the youngest, that sounds like an impossible task. So she read books. She read books because she said she could travel within her books. And I thought that was amazing. And it really increased my love of reading and my love of writing and my love of listening and observing others. Because going through life, you have your inner critic, your inner mind constantly going. And then you think, hmm, I'm going to look at you. What do you have that I don't? We're all the same. We all have that inner critic. We all walk together. And the best thing we can do is support each other. I believe Madeline Albright made the comment, there's a special place in hell for women who don't support each other. And that's something that has resonated with me. Because while I may not value and have every same opinion as every woman in here, my goal is to support you. 
to support you as a woman, to support you as a human being, to support you as a person. Because your ideas and your thoughts matter. Your voice deserves to be heard, no matter the topic. Um, but <coughs> Maya Angelou has an amazing life story, if you've ever, ever heard of it. And she's always inspired me, and that is my favorite poem by her. But I would love to ask Pat Ryan to come up. Pat Ryan has been a editor, an author. Um, just to give you some background, her short fiction has appeared in the Chautauqua Boundaries, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, Chautauqua Moxie Issues, The American Writer's Review, The Ghost Story, and The Hopper. Her articles on movies, music, and literature have appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times, where she was an editor in the culture department. She has worked as an editor at the Folger Shakespeare Library and the National Academy of Sciences, and is a member of the Journalism and Women's Symposium, American Society of Journalists and Authors, and Association of Writers and Writing Programs and you can find uh, her topics from the New York Times if you'd like the information at newyorktimes.com slash by slash pat hyphen Brian. And you wanna know something? She lives here in Deerfield. She's from Turner's Falls originally, and they moved back here to retire. And I thought, what a wonderful opportunity for us to hear from her because she has so much life experience. And if you chat with her for a few minutes, you get to see all of that and hear all of that. And she's been to Paris, and she's been, you know, many other places, but Paris is where I want to go when I turn 50, so um, I, I love to listen to those stories. So Pat Ryan, please come up here. Embarrassing. <laughs> and thank you all for having me here today. I, um, I'd like... I would like to talk about um, the women I've written about. And starting with the New York Times, and now that I'm retired, um, the women I'm writing about in my stories. And um, I like to think that, um, well, my favorite women to write about are the women in fiction because they don't complain. <laughs> and um, I can pretty much recreate, I can make them alive for myself. But I will say that my most popular, uh, the most well-read woman I wrote about in the Times was Marilyn Monroe. And it's got the most <coughs> likes of anything I've ever written. And um, it was also a story I wrote that I put myself in. Uh, usually I don't like to do that. I like to keep it all factual. And I wrote about Edith Wharton and who else? I wrote about Julia Child, Helen Gurley Brown, Pippi Longstocking, and um, who, oh, another very popular one, um, Holly Golightly and uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's, another New York story. So those, oh, and, and my, one of the last articles I wrote was not about a woman, but it was about Shelburne Falls and all the movies that they have been shooting up there. But the, that's the past, that was the New York Times. Now I'm making my own women making up my own women's stories. And one of the ones, and Jennifer said I could read a story. So um, this is one about an older woman who lives um, in Maine on the coast, and she's worried about the environment. And it was first published um, only online in a literary journal called The Hopper that likes to write about the environment. Um, but then the Tilton Library did me the honor of publishing it in this book that they put out um, last year or the year before. So it, I was really, really pleased to actually have it 
in print in a book I could hold, not just online. And they gave it a lovely photo to the book to go with it. And I don't know if any of you got copies of this when it came out. And I don't know if they have any more, but I think if you go to the Tilton Library website, you can get to the book. Uh, I think there's a link to the book. And they, Erica Higgins was the one who asked me for a story. And they did a beautiful job. And all local authors, poets, and photographers. So I give a plug to this. So I'm going to read this story today. And not too long. It's called Distant Shores. And starts off with just one line from a, a Maureen McLean poem called Mesh. I saw the world dissolve in waves. The woman gazed out her window at the gray green waves endlessly slapping the rock bound Maine coastline. She reread her letter from the girl in Togo. Neat handwriting, the French carelessly translated by an aid worker. The girl had thanked her for the photograph, adding, your huge house near the ocean frightens me. The woman lifted her binoculars to the horizon, southeast toward the Gulf of Guinea. Togo, she had learned, rises from its palmy beaches to farmland and mountains. We are now in the rainy season, the girl had written. There will be stormy weather everywhere, the woman thought. Take care, children, tempests are coming. In the background, a radio voice reported on a new study. Summer thunderstorms in North America will likely be larger, wetter, and more frequent in a warmer world, dumping 80% more rain in some areas and worsening flooding. Future storms will also be wilder. The woman turned down the volume and finished reading her mail. Among the newspapers and magazines was a science journal with an article titled, Our Changing Coastlines. She opened to the page and read about a future where vast portions of the United States would be inundated by rising oceans, submerging present coastlines under 30 fathoms of water. Looking heavenward, the woman said, you might be pleased to know, my darling, that your grave will be washed away with the tides and the fishes. Her husband had been noted for his fluid poems about water and all its forms and shapes. She had also been a poet, but was no longer able to compose, for when she sat at her desk, she felt it bucking against her. More alarming, when she walked outside her house, the ground pitched, falling and rising under her feet. She told no one, but if visitors arrived, she stepped slowly and carefully out to greet them hoping they would think it was because she was frail instead of crazy. When her husband was alive, they had not been afraid of the elements. They had bought and renovated this fisherman's cottage sheltered by spruces on a rocky headland hanging over a cove. In the early mornings, they would walk along the windy Atlantic beaches, collecting shells and hoping to encounter Rachel Carson, who lived nearby on her own granite rim of shore. Though they never met, Rachel Carson. They overcame their disappointment by drinking hot rum and reading aloud in the evenings from the edge of the sea. Her husband, poet of the water world, was excited by Carson's passion for the magical zone where land and water merge. Listen to this, he would say back then, reading some passage to her. She had been jealous of that other writer. Over the years, the couple had explored many shores around the world on their 50th anniversary, they flew to Chile and visited the three houses of the poet Pablo Neruda. Their homes, these homes were reflections of Neruda's love of the sea, spiraling upward for the best views of the Pacific and overflowing with nautical artifacts and his collection of seashells. More than 9,000 shells, mollusks, and conchs. One of his houses, built on a rocky promontory overlooking the ocean at Isla Negra, was filled with marine treasures and a huge anchor set into the garden sand. In Valparaiso, after visiting another Neruda house, 
the woman and her husband had sipped Pisco Sours and quoted the lines they could remember from his Ode to the Sea. So much sea, it cannot stay still. He recited, now behave yourself, don't shake your mane, don't threaten anyone, don't smash against the sky. She countered with, my name is sea, it repeats while slamming against rocks. Together they said, me llamo mar. When they returned to Maine, they showed their friends the panoramic photographs of sea and sky on Isla Negra and shared their surprise on learning that Pablo Neruda had been afraid of the ocean. He had declared himself a sailor on land only. Unafraid, they had located the perfect sailboat, bought it and named it the Indigo. Sailing soon became the woman's favorite sport. Now, many years later, with a letter from Togo on her desk and rain pelleting the roof of her cottage, the woman searched for a book from her past, seeking relevance in literature, as she had done with her husband. Where is the Rachel Carson one, she mumbled, that bit about time and the sea. She couldn't find the book, but the phrase came back to her. The differences I sense in this particular instant of time that is mine are but the differences of a moment. A moment, she repeated. For the earth, it's just a moment. And this moment, my particular instant of time, is determined by my place in the long rhythms of the sea. Her husband had said that the edge of the sea was alive to Rachel Carson because it presented an elusive and indefinable boundary. Remembering this, the woman began to tremble. What if there is no longer any boundary? Nothing stopping the relentless sea from smashing against the sky. She began to toss Neruda's poetry books from the shelf until she found the poem she wanted, and she read. A vibration starts up, vague and insistent. A long rumble of thunder adds itself to the weight of the planet and the foam. The groaning rivers of the ocean rise. The star vibrates quickly in its corona, and the sea beats, dies, and goes on beating. The woman, woman looked out her window again. A mere hour had passed, but the waters had meshed, the rain and the ocean. The horizon was lost in a gray seascape. It is gray inside my house, too, the woman thought. She examined her hands. Even my body is gray, she said. The window panes shuddered in the wind. A gust from an open window blew the girl's letter onto the floor. The woman picked it up and studied the ending. After the rain stop, the harmaton will come, the girl had written. Harmaton, according to her dictionary, was a dust-laden wind on the Atlantic coast of Africa. Undiscoverable, undiscoverable pieces of the house quivered and rattled. The radio voice suddenly became louder, announcing, as the ice melts in Antarctica and Greenland, the shape of the earth will change. The woman was perspiring and thirsty. Turning on the tap in the kitchen sink, she gulped handfuls of water and doused her face. The actions made her feel cooler and more stable, but couldn't stop her emotions. The shape of the earth is going to change. The planet's rotation will be disrupted. Gravity will be weakened. Eternity will be closer. We must sail away, the woman said, turning her mind to that memory. How she missed sailing. One bright morning last week, when the sun highlighted the ocean waves, she felt the old longing, the urge to push out in their boat, the indigo. Imagine, darling, if I sailed the indigo all the way to Togo, she said out loud. I could surprise my letter girl. The girl always ends with abiento. Maybe she really would like to see me, the woman thought. She envisioned their meeting on the beach in Togo, followed by a walk to some cozy shelter, then friendly conversation, becoming more familiar as they watched the sunset. As if their meeting were possible, as if it were reality, the woman considered her obligation to the girl. What would I tell her about the rain and the oceans and the rotation of the earth? Should I warn her? No. Better not to predict disaster. I will write a poem about the sea in French as a gift. I will write soothing, fearless words, she said, seating herself at her desk 
and taking up her pen. I will lie. La mer est notre mer, she began, then faltered. The pen dropped from her fingers. She felt the desk rolling like flotsam in the waves. A petrel drifted past the window, rising and dipping on invisible wind. <laughs> many authors. We have lots of children's authors. Um, we have Lily Dwight and we have Julie Cavaco. Um, I also recently heard uh, Mr. Sibley who writes a lot of birding books uh, moved from Concord, Mass and lives in our community as well. Um, but we have, we have a lot of women in our community who are pushing for a variety of change and one person um, that I want to make sure to mention, or two people actually, before, um, before we wrap up this wonderful event today. Um, Emily Dickinson. Emily Dickinson was a woman who mostly kept to herself. She didn't become famous until after she passed. And one of those things that I think about is, what can I do in my life, what can we all do in our lives, to ensure that we have a legacy that lives on? You know, do we come to the senior center and volunteer? Do we come and socialize with our friends? Do we work you know, in private sector, public sector? Do we continue to, how do we make a difference? Some of us have children to pass that down to, some of us do not. But Emily Dickinson wrote a particular poem, Hope is the Thing with Feathers. And I thought this was something we could all use right now. Hope is something that, you know, you think about. What does it mean to you? And hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could have bashed the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. So it's an interesting poem, and it makes you think about what is hope. But look at all the different things that you do every day. Maybe you call a friend, you check in on a family member. You know, there are lots of things in lives that you can do to make a difference. Do you put out bird seed for the birds in the winter? Do you feed the squirrels who are trying to destroy your bird feeder? Maybe you're giving them some, um, my, my squirrels in my neighborhood love avocados. So when my avocados spoil, I put them out because you know sometimes they go right much faster than I use them. And another woman I felt needed to be mentioned today is Eleanor Roosevelt. First name is Anna, so, or Anna, Anna Eleanor Roosevelt. And one of the goals she had when her husband FDR was elected was to make the same salary as he did. So she wanted to make $75,000 a year because I believe that was what the salary was at the time. And she went out and she spoke and did speaking engagements and presentations and all sorts of um, different things, including hosting her own weekly radio show. So not only did you have the fireside chat, but you had Mrs. Roosevelt also doing something similar. So when you look at the history of women, we have made phenomenal progress with the right to vote, but we're still not making the same salary. We're still not considered to be equal in a variety of ways. And I bring this up because recently, Many of you have asked me how you can support the Senior Center. What can you as one person do um, you know, to, to ensure that we get what we need to enjoy this continuity? And it's to speak up, to make your voice heard. And I'm hoping by offering a variety of events, you'll feel like you're being heard and that you'll have your, be able to express your opinions. Um, for a variety of programs that we will offer. Um, but today was really important to recognize the contributions 
um, that women, whether we know personally or someone who's inspired us, make a difference in our lives every day. So if you can't travel, well, look at COVID, it's still around, makes it harder to travel, read a book. Maybe you don't like to read, maybe you like to listen to books. The library has books on tape. Um, there are so many ways that you can become active you know, in our community, just amongst yourselves, to ensure that um, your legacy is shared and the accomplishments maybe you've made can move forward. But I would love to thank you all for coming today. We're going to hopefully do this every year. We have a smorgasbord of scrumptious treats. I hope you will stay and enjoy. And thank you so much to our speakers. Again, Diana Zinel from the Chamber of Commerce, Franklin County, Casey Warren, our town administrator from Deerfield, Jennifer Gannett, our assistant town administrator from Deerfield, myself, Jennifer Remillard from the South County Senior Center, and Pat Ryan, a local author who has um, graciously brought us a story and shared some of her previous articles. If you have any questions for our guests, please feel free to mingle, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.